Yeah, I'm not happy about this haircut at all. Hi there, Coach Sage Candy of VO2 Max Productions here with another training talk. Today we're going to talk about whether or not ultra marathon running, especially mountain ultra trail events, uh, that training and racing, if it makes you slower in the road marathon or half marathon or even a 10k uh, if you like to do the shorter races. And the short answer to that is yes and no. Um, mainly, uh, my short answer is for most of you out there, uh, probably most of my viewers, I think it helps your road marathon time. I think it could really help your performance even on flat courses in the half marathon to marathon range because the general training that you do <clears throat> in ultra marathons uh, is general aerobic base building and it's gonna give you a lot of strength, stamina, and endurance, which is usually the number one thing you need for a road marathon. Now, I'll get into the details of why I think that uh, later on, but. Uh, on the contrary, we'll start off with my personal example, uh, my personal failure in running a faster marathon. You're like, wait a second, Sage, you ran four road marathons uh, in the past 10 months, and you ran slower than your PR. You didn't run a personal best. You failed to qualify for the Olympic Trials Marathon. Uh, you, you came up slower because you started doing these ultras. And to some extent, that's very true. Uh, if you look at my four road marathons I did last year, uh, one of them was in January this year, but it was a 10 month span where I did four road marathons. I averaged 219.56 or something. Uh, it was under 220 average for four marathons with a speed goad and UTMB and comrades mixed in there. Uh, not ideal. And yeah, I ran slower than my PR. My best performance was the 219.12 at Boston that I ran. Uh, and my PR was 216.52. Now, if we look at that on the surface and say, okay, he, he's, he got slower, he sucks, but I was more consistent. <laughs> I was a consistently too slow of a marathon runner, and I didn't hit the goal of running under 219 to qualify for the Olympic trials, which is a big failure in my mind. I really wanted to do that. I failed. I tried, though. Uh, but if you look at it, my performance at Boston, 16th place at the Boston Marathon, I was really happy with. It was probably the best marathon performance of my life. And given the weather conditions that day, it was really crappy, uh, cold, rainy, with a big headwind at the Boston Marathon in 2015. Uh, I give my that time, that 219.12, actually is probably equivalent to my 216.52 marathon PR that I set back uh, in San Diego, rock and roll, back in 2011, when I was actually focusing full time as a professional marathon roadrunner, marathon and half marathon roadrunner, for years and years and years out of college. So I had all this speed development from running 10Ks in college, then I moved up to the marathon for three years at Hanson's Brooks, uh, training exclusively for the marathon, and that was my best PR. So you could weigh the performances however you want, but I think I actually got pretty close to my potential. The other factor that goes in to, that's unfortunate for me, uh, and I don't mean this as an excuse, is that I've trained, I've done a lot of 100 mile weeks in my life, and I'm guessing you probably haven't, because uh, you haven't had the time or energy, or maybe you just started off and running and it wouldn't be a good idea to, but I started doing 100 mile weeks back my sophomore year in college. I've racked up a lot of miles, a lot of years of training, 17 years of year-round running, uh, so I'm closer to scratching, I guess, I'm hitting more of my limiting uh, factor. I'm scratching closer, I guess, to my potential in the road marathon. I've also raced a lot of road marathons. Uh, whereas maybe you've done a little bit less. Maybe you just started running five years ago. Maybe you just started running this year. Maybe you only average 30 or 40 miles a week. So your potential for improvement and for really making big gains, uh, is a lot bigger than mine. For me, shaving off a one minute or two minutes is a really big deal in the marathon, and it would take really specific, dedicated training, probably a whole year focus just on the road marathon. Whereas you, if you're running, let's say maybe you're running a, a three-hour marathon, or you're trying to qualify for Boston, or uh, a 3.30 marathon, you know, you could easily probably get, not easily, but you have the potential to, to chop off a five minute PR, 10 minute PR, maybe even a 20 minute personal best in your marathon time. If you're in that time range, 
uh, in one swoop, you could easily do it. People that followed our stage running training plans have said that they've made that kind of improvement uh, just by changing their training around, increasing their mileage, their weekly mileage, maybe 10 miles per week on average uh, for a number of months. And uh, you, you could really chop off a lot of time. Whereas, obviously, if I chopped off uh, you know, 15 minutes from my time, I'd basically have the world record. Uh, it's not going to happen, but I'd be lucky to chop off a minute uh, with really, really specific dedicated training. So it's a matter of, I guess, what your history is in the sport, kind of what time range you're running in. Uh, and a lot of the people that Sandy and I coach through Sage Running do mix it up with ultra marathons, half marathons, 50Ks, 50 miles, 100 mile ultra races, and they PR in uh, any surface, any distance. They're getting PRs in the half marathon and the 10K. Because uh, what it does is it builds your aerobic pace really well. Now, you say, wait a second, Sage. Let's get into the specifics here. If you're training for some extreme vertical, extreme mountain courses, uh, that's a lot different than running on a flat, smooth, uniform surface. So the more extreme sky running races, so to speak, or you know something like the, the Hard Rock 100, or uh, even like Speed Goat, or something really technical with a lot of power hiking and a lot of vertical displacement on steep slopes, that is less specific than running on a perfectly flat, even track or doing a really fast race. Whereas more runnable trails, like uh, I call them California style trails because there are a lot of races in California uh, that are smooth single track that undulate like a roller coaster, but it's still very, very runnable. You're running fast the whole time. Those it's easier to transition back and forth to. And so it comes down to specificity of the vertical profile of the course you're running. And obviously if you're really good at power hiking, you're really good at, at climbing and doing really steep technical slopes, it takes a longer time to specifically build your leg muscles to, do, to transition back to running flat and fast. And likewise the transition from running flat and fast to running uh, really steep vertical profiles takes a long time. For example, I came from the runnable background I really suck at power hiking. I'm probably always going to really suck at power hiking. I'm not a good power hiker. Uh, Killian Jornet is a very good power hiker. He's also a very good technical descender, but that's another story altogether. Uh, the, you know, those guys blow my doors off. Um, but, you know, coming from the road background, the road and track background, making that transition, it's more of a muscular thing. It's more of an efficiency, uh, running economy thing. And if you get our, our book, it's a book plug, Sage Running Secret, A Guide to Speedy Ultras. It's an ebook. It's on our website, sagerunning.com. Uh, I kind of go into this uh, pretty in depth uh, about variable running economy, which I think is a key secret to making that transition any surface, any distance, despite the fact that I may have failed in it in the past year. Uh, but I try. Um, and so your heart and lungs don't know the difference. If you're out there doing a three hour long run in the mountains, you're out there doing uh, a three hour long run on the roads, which is pretty long, long run on the roads, uh, your heart and lungs are getting trained maybe at the same intensity level, uh, the same spectrum, you're getting the same stimulus, but the body's getting a lot more pounding on the road. Uh, you might cover a lot more miles, a lot more horizontal miles uh, on the road, Whereas in the mountains, you might do a lot more vertical displacement, vertical climbing. And so that's kind of a, a key difference in differentiating that. The heart and lungs don't know the difference, uh, but the skeletal muscular system does. And it does play a role in your speed and efficiency, your efficiency at all relative paces, but also your efficiency in what activity you're doing, whether you're power hiking up a 40 degree slope, 40% uh, grade slope, or you're running around a track that's perfectly flat and even. I don't like the track. You can't, you can't hide on the track. I don't have good flat basic speed on a, on a 10K in a track. So it's good to, to mix it up. It's good for variety in training. And it does take a while to transition between these extreme mountain ultra trail events. Now, the other variable, of course, is distance and time. Obviously, a, a 100 mile race like the Hard Rock 100 would be a lot different from a, a flat 100 mile track race. Uh, which is a lot different from any 50K uh, because we're talking about changes in big duration. Whereas if you're real, really well trained for a marathon and you're going into a, a 50K, that's a very runnable 50K, uh, you can make that transition very easily, I think. So uh, there is you know, specificity in, in what event you're training for, obviously, but the general principles are there. And the general principle is that if you train very well for a long endurance event, uh, especially over a marathon, 
you're gonna help yourself in all those aspects of building leg strength, of building your cardiovascular engine, of developing really good uh, fat burning fuel efficiency and the ability to spare glycogen. And so you have all these benefits at your, uh, that you gain from endurance training and that could be translated into a lot of different mountain ultra trail events, but also the road marathon and half marathon. And you know, the transition, it took longer than I expected uh, for myself. When I go back and try to train for the 2020 Olympic trials, US Olympic trials, if they don't lower the standard, uh, I'm gonna have to devote a good six months, if not 10 months probably, to very dedicated road marathon training and also try to run faster courses that aren't in, in bad weather. Although I will say my last two marathons in Houston and Cal International were fast courses in good weather. So I'm out of excuses there. Boston Marathon, my best marathon performance in my life. I was happy with it, but I failed, and I don't want you to fail. Uh, but I'm saying you could definitely take a lot of time probably off your marathon PR. Unless you're running in the in the 220 range, maybe it might be harder, but if you're uh, above that range and maybe you're just scratching the surface of your potential, you have a lot of time to shave off, and you could succeed doing that as well as these ultra marathon events. And that's what I just wanted to wrap up with this training talk today, uh, is just highlight those differences and to hopefully uh, give you some motivation, get out there and train. Uh, thanks so much for all the support on here. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all the support on Patreon. Uh, really trying to up my game with all these videos on here, on there, uh, as well as uh, more uh, social media posting. Thanks for all the comments. I really, really appreciate them all. Uh, share this video if you like it, and feel free to subscribe for future training talks, as well as comment for future training talk topics and vote. Uh, thank you again, guys. Really appreciate the support. Hope your training's going well, and stay tuned for more VO2 Max Productions. Mm -hmm.